sometimes the best stories in golf aren't found on tour. You'll find them at the back of the range. And here's your host, Ben Adelberg. And welcome to the Back of the Range. I am your host, Ben Adelberg. This is episode 148. Well, I am back home in South Florida after my week-long excursion to TPC Sawgrass and then on to South Carolina and then back down to Tampa before finally getting home. Over 1,200 miles driven, four different hotels, five different golf courses, one snapped driver shaft, not an anger, it just fell apart on me and some fantastic experiences with some new friends. Thanks to my pal Steve Carter, Duke Butler, and D-Rock for the game at Dyes Valley at Sawgrass. It was actually my first time there and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Chichesse Creek in South Carolina is just a walk back in time. And while it was pretty steamy and uh, we didn't play very well, that place was a lot of fun. Uh, Bulls Bay is possibly in my top 10. We played 36 that day. Can't thank my host enough for putting everything together. If you saw the pictures I posted on Instagram, you saw my comment. It's a place that you have a really tough time leaving. One more round of beers? Sure. Another 18? Sure. It's just fun golf. Got to thank my pal Mike for putting everything together in South Carolina. Incredible host, and his pals really made the time that much more special. My tournament experience in Tampa? Well, I think I ran out of gas. Um, I played some pretty terrible golf. Not really afraid to admit that because, well, they post the results online. But uh, I did get to play alongside my friend and former guest on the podcast, Rick Wolf. Um, Rick's a legend, soon to be inducted into the Florida State Golf Association Hall of Fame for his accomplishments over the years. Um, Multiple time player of the year, numerous championships to his name. And he almost shot his age right in front of me. Missed it by one. He missed a par putt in 18 and shot 71. Yep, Rick Wolf is 70 years old. And with the beard, he looks 98. Sorry, Rick. But I'm back in the saddle. Plenty of great guests coming up over the next few weeks. I know that we have some awesome tournaments this summer on the amateur side and the professional side. Hope that they all get played as scheduled. As always, stay safe and stay healthy. Just a couple housekeeping items. As you know, we're on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Every single episode is available at thebackoftherange.com. Don't be afraid to leave a review in Apple Podcasts. And I still have some logo golf towels for sale. If you need information on that, hit me up online. Ben at thebackoftherange.com is the email. Or send me a DM on Instagram, Facebook, you know where. My guest on this episode of The Back of the Range is Tim Jackson from Germantown, Tennessee. I have received tons of requests over the last couple months from people all over the country. You gotta get Tim Jackson. In fact, Tim is the kind of guest that checks off every box, so to speak, when you think about the birth of this podcast. You know, I love talking to the collegiate players, especially the ones that go on to be incredible professionals like Morikawa and Hovland. And of course, sitting down with Mr. Nicholas was incredible. But the career amateurs, the ones that have been dominant in their state for years and years, well, those tend to be my favorite guests. And Tim Jackson is pretty darn high on that list. If you haven't heard of him before and you're thinking, well, well, Ben, what's this guy done? Well, let's see. He's one of five men to win multiple U.S. Mid-Am championships. He did that in 94 and 2001. He's played on two Walker Cup teams. And in Tennessee... Unless I'm going to get some pushback from a guy named Danny Green, more more on him later, Tim is the GOAT of Tennessee amateur golf. He's the greatest of all time. And here's just one reason why. He is the only player in Tennessee history to win the State Am, the State Open, the State Mid-Am, the State Match Play, and the State Senior Open. Tim and I chatted for an hour, but it could have been five hours. We couldn't get to everything, but that's okay, because I think I'll have him on for a follow-up episode very soon. But in this conversation, we hit on several topics. His start in the game, one of the best Walker Cup matches in history, the match that he wishes he had back, and I even got him to talk about his multitasking son who served as his caddy at the U.S. Senior Open. And yes, for those of you that know anything about golf in the state of Tennessee, 
I got Tim to talk a little bit about Danny Green, and I think I might be able to get him on the podcast as well. We'll have to see. But for now, sit back with your favorite beverage and enjoy my chat with the legend, Tim Jackson. Tim, welcome to the back of the range, sir. How are you? Hey, great, Ben. Thanks thanks for having me, and uh been looking forward to this for quite a while. Well, I, we've been trying to do it, but this world kind of has been uh, getting in our way uh, with uh, with COVID and all this other stuff. I mean, I, I'm, we're recording on July 1st. I want to make sure listeners know, because as you and everyone knows, things change on a day-to-day basis, it seems. Um, you know, you're not just a avid golfer, competitive golfer. We'll get into a lot of your achievements later, but you also um, are involved in the execution and the administration of, uh, you know, Tennessee Golf Association. So, boy, I don't know where to start with this, but uh, what's what's life been like for you with the game of golf recently in the last couple months? Well, you know, starting all the way back into, you know, late January, particularly on the administrative side of golf with the, with the Tennessee Golf Association, I was installed as uh, president for the second time, the 1st of February, our annual meeting. And then it was soon thereafter when, uh, you know, the uh, the world started turning upside down. Yeah. And so from a golf perspective here, we, uh, we have played, we are about to play our first TGA event next week. Our, our match, men's match play at uh, Lookout Mountain Golf Club in uh, Chattanooga. And so we're, we've condensed, we run about 14 state championships over a six month period. And we're, and we're basically going to condense that schedule into about a three month uh, time period. So okay. we're, 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 we only thing we lost this year was the state open. Um, and, but we, we've, our plan is to, to get everything else in. So we'll hopefully the virus will calm down a little bit. We won't have, uh, you know, you know, any more pullbacks or, you know, or a need to cancel, but, uh, you know, so far in Tennessee, we, we've had, a, we've had a little increase in, cases here in the last couple of weeks but most of that has been confined to uh, a couple of counties up in east tennessee not to severe county so something we have to watch you know constantly sure. and and i talk to staff uh, quite frequently about you know you know are we going to touch the flag stick are we going to have you know are we going to rake bunkers you know what are we going to do so it, it's really a, it's really something that you never really think about but uh it, it, I mean, everything's in play right now. I remember when the when the rule change, the USGA made the rule change where you can leave the flagstick in to putt, and and that was the mm-hmm. big conversation. Do you leave it in? Do you take it out? And I remember when when Adam Scott and Bryson were like, "Oh, I'm got to leave it in. That's it's an advantage." And now it's like, right. like, look, I don't care what you do with the flagstick. I just want to play golf, man. I mean, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's that's it. It's, I you, think everybody's everybody's jonesing and ready to get at it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so particularly guys that, you know, play competitive golf. I mean, you can only, you know, go out and hit balls and work on your game when, you you know, for so long, you don't have anything to look forward to. So, uh, uh, but anyway, it's, uh, I know, I know here in Tennessee, we're, we're excited and ready to get started. You mentioned competitive golf and uh, we'll talk about your accomplishments and some of your achievements over gosh, 30, 35 year, you know, amateur golf career. But I, I'm, am I correct in assuming that that competitive golf tournament golf is primarily all you're interested in playing in? That's pretty much it. I, I'm not a big social golfer. Uh, I never really was, even when I was, uh, you know, uh, working quite a bit, I, I um, you know, kind of did everything around a tournament schedule and, and a lot of my playing a lot of my social golf that I did was kind of geared around, you know, three or four days before I'd leave to go play in a tournament or something. I try to get out and play a play a round or two, you know, with some guys. And uh, but that that's pretty. And then when my youngest son, he was he was my golfing buddy, and so from the time he was eleven or twelve until he, you know, was twenty three or so when he, you know, when he finished college. I mean, he was my he was my he was my guy and all of his college teammates. So I, I like playing with the younger kids. I always have, and so that was that was kind of what I did. And I honestly, he I, he's been gone a couple of years, and I really, I really miss that. To yeah. Be honest with you. How do you, now, now? You mentioned this is your second stint as president of Tennessee Golf Association. How can you maybe convey to someone that maybe plays at their their local club, and sure they'll they'll you know shoot seventy fives or or maybe get around par. 
And um, how do you maybe draw someone like that, or even if they're shooting in the high 70s, whatever it is, how do you draw someone like that into tournament golf? How do you properly explain to them, like, look, I know you're having fun at your club, and you're maybe taking a couple bucks from your buddies, and, and you know, the three-footers are conceded, and then that's all well and good, but you don't know what you're missing if you're not playing tournament golf. Well, and you know, and not everybody is wired for that. Right. Uh, you know, because the, you know, what, uh, what tends to happen, you know, when they're at home, you know, they're zipping around, they're playing in three hours and 10 or 15 minutes, and, you know, everybody's flying around, and when we get in a tournament environment, it slows down a little bit, and and it, it, in, in that slowing down process, it kind of, I think it kind of weighs on some people, you know, and that's where the nerves start coming in a little bit, and so it's not for everybody. I, I, I do get it. I mean, it's a great game, but, but tournament golf is not, it's not for everybody. Um, but I, but I have, you know, particularly those, these mid am golfers that you guys that played in college and then they get out, they go to work, but they, they leave the game for, for a number of years. You know, it's not unusual to see them leave for five or 10 years and then come back to it, you know, in their early to mid thirties. And, uh, and a lot of those guys, they pick their game up pretty quick. And so I've always tried to encourage them to, Hey man, get back into it. Cause you really don't understand all of the opportunities that you have in front of you. And I kind of share some, some of my story with them that I was just kind of a, you know, a average kind of a golfer and struggling along. And then I was able over a winter, you know, kind of put some things together and, and make some progress. And your, your progress is kind of can be leaps and bounds and you have that one good week and then you're set up, you know, you're kind of set up from that point forward to uh, now you're able to really get in some good events and, be a little picky and choosy with your schedule and you've had many uh it's funny how you talk about this this you know something that just set you up you've had a lot of things in your playing career that have set you up um you know you've had tremendous success on the national level you know two-time u.s mid-amateur champion played on two walker cups uh low amateur in three consecutive u.s senior opens but i'm curious when you mentioned a little bit of a later start because it sounds like you spent the majority of your 20s uh, working and establishing your career, I'm guessing you inched into it by playing Tennessee state events and then ultimately go to the national level. Um, what was maybe, if you can possibly pinpoint a, maybe something that helped you bridge the gap between state and national level competition, what was something that, that led you to believe, okay, I might be able to do this? Going back a little bit further than that, sure. I, I was not, I didn't grow up a golfer. I was a I was a baseball player, you know, pretty good baseball player on competitive teams from the time I was seven years old to 16. So I took the game up when I was about 16 years old. So didn't have the early formal training or access to the clubs and all that, and all the, the niceties that kind of, you know, helps learning the game a little easier. Sure. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm kind of a late bloomer, I guess would be what I would call. So, you know, by the time I got into my, college years uh you know i was really into the game and and i did play a couple of years of uh of i went to murray state originally and and played golf and it, you know it didn't work out my academics were you know suffering so i just decided to shelve the golf get you know get do take care of business and i come back to it so i played in my first state amateur when i was 27 years old wow. which is very unusual you know and Seven years later, uh, yeah, or eight years later, I was a USGA champion. So <laughs> I think to answer your question, to bridge the gap, uh, we, we, we have a really rich history in the state of Tennessee. We have, a, we have a, you know, when I was coming in there during that time period, there were a lot of really good players, both college level juniors and also a lot of good mid am players. And, uh, and so I, I figured out early that if I can do well in Tennessee, that same game is going to equate pretty good on the national level. So I knew that if I could play well and win in Tennessee, that I, I had a chance to do well, you know, nationally. Well, that, that speaks volumes for, for, for that state golf association, all the people that compete at that, uh, in that state. We'll, we'll get to a couple people from Tennessee a little bit later in the episode because 
you know I can't not ask you a question about Danny Green. I mean, you just know, you know. I mean, I'm just, I'm just buttering you up right now. And oh set, yeah, you're setting me up. I'm for that setting one. you up because you know it's coming. Um, but uh, all right, so you, you, you win these. Um, I mean, you've, you've the, the achievements in Tennessee. Uh, you know, multiple amateurs. You mentioned you like playing against the kids. So before I talk a little bit about this U.S. Mid Am and about Walker Cup, um, how I, I've, I've even noticed this myself. I mean, I'm 43. And if I'm ever paired with someone that's like 17 or 18, I look at, okay, maybe they're hitting it 20 feet or 20 yards past me. And, and they, you know, they got a swing that looks like it, it fell right out of golf digest, but I know if they miss a three footer, everything could just absolutely explode and they could be done. What are maybe some of the things that you're looking at when you're paired with these younger kids? Are you well aware of that as well? Or are you kind of just in your own head taking care of your own business? How do you find yourself so successful against maybe younger younger players? I'm just I'm just pretty much doing my own thing and okay. playing try, trying to play to the strengths of what you know what I had as far as the you know to the I get my advantages were I, I was I was really good with course management, you know, the middle side of the game. I was from a talent standpoint I was, I always considered myself, you know, average to a little, maybe slightly above average, but I made up for it with uh, the competitiveness and game management and course management and, you know, lim- eliminating, you know, the big mistakes. Sure. I, you know, learn to drive the ball in the fairway, you know, learn to uh, learn to become a pretty good, you know, chipper and bunker player, scrambler. Uh, my putting was always streaky. You know, I either had weeks where I made everything. Or I had weeks where, you know, I just, you know, nothing seemed to win in. So it was either kind of off or on for me. Um, so, but, uh, no, I just try to get in there and do my own thing and, you know, and we'll just add them up at the end. So are you, uh, are you trying to say that you're the total package there, uh, Tim? <laughs> You have talked to some of our old Hey, man, I, 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 will, I will get it, get as much intel as I can before I get someone oh, like you on this man. podcast. So. Oh, you're, you're, you've done some good research. Yeah, you know, that, all that, that's, that would take a long time to talk about that. But uh, to, to a few people, I was uh, considered the total package. You're, you're exactly right. <laughs> so who gave you the nickname TP? You could spell it. Well, that's, yeah, that's Mr. Corville up in Connecticut. And uh, I... I and I spoke with him. Matter of fact, I talked to him on the phone about two or three weeks ago. First time I talked to him in several years. So, yeah, we had a kind of a standing practice round pairing where Corville and John Harris and Marucci and I, we, we would tend to play all of our, most of our practice rounds together at, at the USGA events. And, and then every once in a while we play it in the Northeast or Sunny Hannah. But yeah, we, we had some, we had some really good games uh, over the years. So he gave you the nickname, the total package. And, uh, and that was, and that was from a WWE. Uh, oh, well, he, oh, he, oh, if you want to talk, w, oh, yeah, you yeah. want to talk wrestling uh, now. Yeah, that I, was, that was, oh. Jerry was a big, Jerry, Jerry was a big WWE. He watched the, the Monday night raw stuff. And then he oh, would, dear he would come back in. He'd tell all the stories of, you know, the, what's going on and this and that. <laughs> and he said, and then somehow, Lex Luger. You got your I nickname for Lex yeah. Luger. Oh, yeah. my God. So, yeah. So, <laughs> so somehow, you know, I watched it, and I said, yeah, I like this guy, Total Package, and it just kind of stuck from there. Well, so, <laughs> Well, I I will have to I'll have to ask that to Corville as well when I get him on the mm-hmm. podcast, too. Wow, mm-hmm. that's, that's fantastic. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about this U.S. Mid-Am. You, you have two victories, one in 94, one in 2001, and – you know, both of these final matches, you win one up uh, in 94, you, you beat Tommy Brennan uh, one up. And then 2001, you're, you beat Zeringer. And that was actually the first year it was 36 holes. You, mm-hmm. you mentioned um, some people like tournaments and some people don't. And it is very, uh, you know, it has to be very methodical and there's a lot of pressure. But I'm guessing, gosh, winning those matches one up when you know what's on the other end of a victory, you're going to the Masters. Now, Hazeltine in 94, from what I've been able to determine, was just terrible weather and really not representative of the skill that you and Brennan had as far as, you know, you're not throwing birdies at each other, I don't think. Yeah, so that week, the weather was fantastic. I mean, all week long, it was like uh, mid-September, so early, you know, early fall, and it was just perfect until the final. And then the front comes through, 
the temperature goes from 75 to 40, I think it was 42 oh my gosh. that day and, and, and blowing and raining sideways. And, and I made, I think I made, I think I made 15 pars and three bogeys and won the match one up. Wow. So, yeah. So, I mean, you know, so no, I mean, it was just, a, it was just a survival, you know, and you were just, it was just a total grind from the first hole all the way to the finish. And, um, I mean, we get on 18 and we both, we both hit three wood up that hill against the wind. We had three woods for our second shot. We both, we both hit them on the green. Tommy hit his ball on the green first. He was 50 or 60 feet below the hole. And I hit my ball probably 30 feet, just kind of leftish center of the green. And he lipped his out from 50 feet. Gosh. I mean, it, I'm telling you, it did everything but go in. And, um, and then I, you know, I knocked mine about five feet past the hole and had to make a five footer, but you know, straight down, heel down, win. I said, all I got to do is just get it started. It's going to, it's going to get to the hole. And of course, luckily, it, it, luckily it went in and, and, uh, but yeah, you just can't really think about all that. You just have to get in there and play that match and, you know, hope everything, you know, works out in the end. Um, that's, that's crazy because 18th at Hazeltine, I just, I'm thinking back to those highlights of the Ryder Cup that was just there in 16 and, and thinking about Reed and, and uh, you know, Mickelson and, and with their final matches that went all the way to the end, I believe. And they're, what are they hitting, seven irons, eight irons in there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's yep. that's crazy. Yeah, I think, and this was, this was old technology. Well, you know, sure, I'm sure. Thinking, I'm thinking we were, you know, we were hitting anywhere from four iron to six iron, you know, I think for the week. You know, depending on the wind and the key locations and all, but that's pretty. And then, and then we get to that hole; it's howling right in our face. And you know, <laughs> I'm thinking, "Hey, Par Par's going to do it here." Because oh, I, sure. I, I wasn't up in the match all. I was behind all day, and I was, I was one down with on the 15th green. Uh, Tommy had about a, I would say he had about a 12 footer for birdie, and I had about an eight footer for par. And I'm one down, and he missed it, and I made it to stay one down. And the, the next hole, the 16th, was their signature hole, you know, around the lake there. And uh, I won that hole with a par to get even. And then 17, had that front left pin that they like to use over that bunker. And I just hit it, and took it in there, center of the green, past the hole, just trying to make three. And, uh, and won that hole with a par. And so I go from, you know, one one down and three pars got me to one up, you know, in a three hole stretch. So incredible, uh, yeah. So it was uh, brutal conditions for sure. These uh, these U.S. Mid Am victories open up a lot of doors for you. Uh, none greater than uh, you know the Masters Augusta National, and you play in in two Masters ninety five two thousand two. I mean you ninety five. I mean I'm just thinking, gosh, you're there for you know Crenshaw and and just that incredible Masters that he won, and then. 02 is when Tiger went back the, the back end of his uh, back to back. No, no U.S. Mid Am champion has has made the cut of the Masters until uh, until Hagestad did it in uh, right. And I right. believe it was 2017, 2018, 2018 I think. And yeah. um, can you possibly explain why that is? Is it is it just for the simple fact that it's just you know it's one guy every year and yeah. You know, well, I mean, from my perspective, and not make excuses. You know, back in those days, I was a practicing CPA. So, I mean, I was uh, in the office until the week before the Masters, and I leave and go play the Azalea, oh and then gosh. drive down. So that was my prep. Okay. So I knew. So, so I had to just adapt a more realistic attitude of, hey, let's just go out here, see what we can find, and and just you know enjoy the experience and soak it up. The first year, the first time I played, I played the original golf course. It was like sixty. 900 yards right and all week long it's firm and fast and i'm playing really good okay i mean i'm like you know i can i can play this golf course when it's firm and fast and and you know i can i can i can make the cut here well it, it falls a flood wednesday night and I'm playing in the rain and the slop all day thursday you know and it just and the conditions did the same so at 02 the next time i played was the new course, the new lengthened course, same thing, just a quagmire, just, you know, and when the golf course gets like that on the, on back then, anyway, there were only five or six people 
at that level that could win the golf tournament. You know, and that's it. Yeah. It's just the, the, the but when it's firm and fast, it opens it up for, you know, 25 or 30 guys to have a chance. So, you know, for example, for example, Zach Johnson. Zach oh, Johnson has no, he has no chance winning that tournament unless it's firm and fast. And the year he won, it was windy, cold, firm and fast, and he shoots two over and wins the golf tournament or whatever it was. He was over par and won the tournament. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, I mean, that guy, how he parlayed that, uh, that weather into a master's, uh, win is it's incredible. I mean, mm -hmm. you, uh, and I think the lengthening of the course, you can probably blame on a former Walker cup teammate. Don't you think? Oh yeah. Yeah. There's no <laughs> question about it. You know, and, and we, we were all introduced, you know, and I, I tell us one of the conversations I had with Jerry Corwell, I said, you know, you think about it, when we were playing in the 90s, you think there were a lot of mid-ams back then. You know, there were a lot of guys that, yeah. that played. And, uh, and I said, it was kind of like, you know, we were, you know, I mean, I don't want this to sound the wrong way, but it was almost like, you know, we were the kings, you know. The, we were the older guys, and we were kind of, and we were still playing good, and we were competing with the younger guys, and it was just, it was a great time, you know, for, for amateur golf and uh and we thoroughly enjoyed it and so but we all got introduced to tiger and it was different immediately obviously and um it's just been it's been fun you know to watch uh you know his career and the kind of player he developed into and uh you know people ask me all the time well who do you think is the best player that's ever lived and this and that and you can debate you know, all day long, and I always, I always size it up as a one A and a one B. It's kind of like sure. my favorite, my favorite college football teams. It's a one A and one B. I have two of them. So one A is Tiger, one B is Jack, and the greatest ball striker that's ever lived, and it's not even close, is Ben Hogan. Yep. Those are the three. Those are the three greatest players of all time, in my opinion. So, um, but. Uh, you know, Tiger may not get there with the with the majors for Jack, but he's played the best golf that's ever been played. You know, particularly on a, on a one year stretch. Yeah, well, um, you you saw it uh, you saw it up close. I mean, you lost to him in the quarters of the uh, '94 USM, and you know that that run in that tournament, and then obviously you know winning the US Mid Am in '94 gets you onto that Walker Cup team in '95. I Right. You know, and you're on that team and you're on the 99 team. And, and I'm sure it's beyond your wildest imagination to be able to represent your country twice. And then, but unfortunately it wasn't in the United States. You played, but you played road games both times. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't mind that. I, that golf over there suits me. I like, I like that kind of golf that we, you know, obviously we didn't, we didn't come out on the right end of that. And that, that, that's always, you know, left a bitter taste in my mouth. And, um, uh, you know, credit to credit to them, but uh, yeah, it's uh, I, I I really I, I look back at my career, and the one thing I regret was that I didn't commit to the British Amateur. Okay. Know, to because I was exempt for many many years, and and I kept keep telling myself and my wife, so I'm going to go next year. I'm going to go next year. So I get to be, you know, in my mid 40s, and I'm going to go, and I'm no longer exempt. <laughs> <laughs> so. So, you know, I just, I just really regret not, you know, at least committing to that over a five or six year period and seeing what, seeing what could have, you know, what might've happened there. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Cause I was going to ask you about that. Cause a lot of your accomplishments from, at least from what I've been able to, to dig up, it's a lot of things that are here based in the States. I don't see a lot of senior British open or, or senior no. British amateur. So I, I that no, kind of surprised I, you know, me. Yeah. I, I, ch I was on airplanes for 20 years ch chasing that, 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 Plum, which was the Walker Cup team, which is what everybody in my day was playing for. Okay. And so, you know, I did it for 20 years and, you know, did them all, you know, Sunny Hannah, Porter, Northeast, Southern, the USGA events, you know, and then still trying to play a, a state schedule to support, you know, what we were doing here. Right. And uh, so, you know, that, you know, I just. Can't play everything. Being, yeah. Well, Danny and I about, you know, kind of about the same way, you know, we, we turned 55 and everybody's like, Oh man, you guys, I know you're excited about, or when I turned 50, you know, I said, why am I excited about turning 50? I said, I, you know, <laughs> I've already kind of pretty much left the best of it out there, you know? And, uh, although, you know, my fifties uh, were, 
Yeah. <laughs> were, I played some good golf in my 50s. Yeah, yeah. Probably, I arguably probably played the best golf that I ever played in my 50s, which is very, very, you know, very blessed to, to have that late in career. And I, and I give that to my son and his, and his college buddies, you know, keeping me sharp and motivated. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy that this game you can say something like that. I don't know many games. I don't, I don't think a lot of basketball players or football players are st- stating that or tennis or anything like that where their fifties is when they really hit it. I mean, you had this, you had a great. I mean, your your two Walker Cups, you know, a very solid. Uh, you know, one one and one in ninety five, two and one in ninety nine. I mean, that loss in ninety nine. I I have to ask you. I mean, it's it's you and Gossett against. Oh, yeah, man. I, I know. I mean, oh, I'm glad you're asking. I'm glad you're because I never really get to talk about that much. Well, and, we do that here, man. I mean, I, I know man, who that was. It was you and Gossett against Paul Casey, yeah. Luke Donald. You lose one up, and I'm just guessing, gosh, I wish there was tape of that match. Man, let me tell you what. That was that was one of the best things I was ever involved in. We we were we were down. We were like four down after five. I, I don't know if you have access to the – to the scoring records, but I, but I think my memory serves me that we were like four down after five and we kind of righted the ship. We had a few holes and then we chipped one a hole. And I think we were probably three down at the turn, but we got to this rhythm where, on a, where I was driving it and putting it on about, you know, the way it worked out. Yeah, it's foursomes, yeah. Three, you know, a three or four hole stretch. And, uh, and I mean, we, we started smoking them. And got back in the match, and it all came down to the last hole. And uh, David hit an approach in there. I was about, oh, probably 12 or 13 feet, you know, and they were 15 or 20, and they missed the putt. And I've got this putt to have the match. Oh. And then, literally, I hit the putt, and it gets within two or three feet of the hole, and I start, I start, well, I take that step to go get it yeah. because it's center cut, and it just – completely horseshoed out oh. and uh and we and we lost the match one down but you know luke donald and he was i referred to him he was the hell Irwin of, of amateur golf at that time you know nothing nothing spectacular but there was never anything missed there was right right nothing was ever missed not there was no thin shots there was every drive had maybe two yards of curve on it and then Casey was the other. He was the power player, the birdie, birdie guy, you know. Um, but it was, it, you know, it's always good to play the best they got, you know, and um, see how you stack up. But we came pretty close there to getting a half point off of them. Wow. That's a that's a great story. Yeah, I saw that, and I was like, oh, i got to ask you about that. What um, One of the greatest things that I saw last year when I was over at the Walker Cup at, uh, at Liverpool – I see these these former players and captains milling around. You know, there's Holt Grieve and Bob Lewis and, uh, you know, Sigal's running around. Well, Sigal's around, and, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, Marucci's there. What has been your involvement with the Walker Cup, uh, you know, since, since 90, I guess since 99? But um, are you uh, involved as far as – because, you know, obviously not every guy that plays two Walker Cups is going to be a captain someday, but – there's not a lot yeah. of two-time Walker Cuppers. What's been your involvement with Walker Cup? Well, I mean, obviously, I'm a member of the Walker Cup Society, of and, I, and I and I can go to any and all of these functions that, that come up. Uh, I, I I have just not been. I just haven't traveled that much I've, since I've slowed my playing down, and and uh, I just you know, and probably to a fault, you know, and maybe that's why I hadn't been a captain. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I went in '09. I was a I was the first alternate when I was 50 years old for that team at Marion. Wow! And I was I was asked to go, um, but you really as an alternate, you really you just kind of there's not anything you can do. You can't even really go onto the property. It's just kind of like you're there, and if somebody you know gets injured, then you then you jump in there. You know you don't have a you don't have a bag. You don't have the uniform. Right. So, you know, I don't know what I don't know what you're going to do. But that would have looked kind of anyway, odd. <laughs> Some guy from the gallery know, just bring but, out. But I, but, but we went. My wife and I went that that week, and so I participated in the society things. And it was really good to see a bunch of, you know, particularly a bunch of the old Walker Cuppers that went on to have good pro careers. And I got to got to know several of them, and and uh, just you know, just a fun time. So, yeah. you know, probably will will be involved at the at the um, at the one next year down yeah. at uh, Seminole. Um, 
but uh, yeah, it's. Uh, and I'll just tell you that people ask me, well, what you know, what's the best thing you've done? Was playing in the Masters? Well, they just assume playing in the Masters was the best thing I was ever involved in. And, and really and truly, for me, the best thing I was involved in was you know, one A, being a Walker Cup team member, and one B, you know, being a USGA champion, you know, making you know, winning those final matches, you know, yeah. you know, that, that those are the two things that I, that I would have to say for me anyway, have been the highlight of, um, you know, my amateur career. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that because most people, you're right. Most people think they automatically look at masters and, you know, masters is the, is the, maybe the, the treat or the, the reward that's, extra besides actually the achievement which is winning a usg championship and obviously uh, getting onto a walker cup team you mentioned coleman you mentioned i'm sorry you mentioned seminole um mm-hmm. which is i'm sure you know that tournament pretty darn well the coleman invitational you've won you know the, the main tournament several times you've won the senior uh, uh edition several times you go in this incredible run where i guess you know eight years in a row you're either winning it or runner up now i'm sure you saw that match between between rory dj and and wolf fowler right um, that weather looked pretty calm i'm guessing you've seen seminole in a much different manner oh i've seen it yeah absolutely i've 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 played in the coleman many years where i make the turn with the lead and shoot you know 40 41 on the back and lose you know and, and more than once and so i, I just kind of said you know i just having a hard time getting over this hump at Seminole, you know, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, you coming down the stretch and it's blowing 25 to 30, you know, off the water there and you're coming, coming down, you know, 16, 17 and 18. And you know, that, that little shot you got there, a little, whatever, you know, you can hit whatever club there at 17, you know, but trying to they put that pin all the way in that back finger back there. And there's no way you can, you just got to hit the middle of the green and hope the two putt from, 40 feet you know and in 18 you just got to step up there and you've got to hit a you've got to hit a quality shot into that green you know uh, or you can make you know, i've seen i've seen you you can think of it i've seen it happen on that green in the last day i've seen the, i've seen a guy put it off the green to lose the ball run 50 yards down off the where they used to use a little front right pin the last day yeah. they stopped doing, they stopped doing that I've seen a guy seven putt uh, to lose. I've seen uh, guys hit them into the in, up into the sea grapes, you know, and yeah. making triples to lose. I mean, so it's just all kind of nightmares, you know, on that on that on that hole, just trying to trying to get in with the wind howling. Well, I I got to play it recently. Um, I had Jimmy Dunn on the podcast, and and he invited me out there, and I played it and. Um, I, I think we played one tee box up obviously. And, but, but I remember having about 115 yards into that green mm-hmm. and I hit it onto the green and I two putted for a par and I was almost disappointed that I didn't have a tougher time because I wanted to kind of get that feeling of like, Oh my gosh, this is now I get it. This is impossible. Yeah. Um, now I'm okay. Not seven putting because that would have been a little embarrassing, but, yeah. but still I was like, yeah, I totally see. Well, I mean, uh, uh, Scott Harvey. I mean, Scott Harvey won. He, he, I think made triple and one by one. Yeah. I mean, any, anything can happen on it. It's never over uh, until you put out on 18 because it, anything can happen. I mean, the, the, tell you the scary when they were using that front right hole at 18 and the, and you had the normal wind. So, so when you're on that green, if you're past the hole in the middle of the green, you're downhill down grain, down wind. And, and all all that's in the back of your mind is the, and I'm not going to name names of who it was that put it off the green, but all you can think about is, you know, the worst thing you can think, which is whatever you do, don't do, the, you know, right, which you don't, you don't ever say that to yourself. You, know, you don't need to be thinking that way, but but it just, it worked, the golf course works on you that way. It's it's It will get in your head. Well, the golf course is one thing, but I, I have to imagine that, I mean, the Coleman, it's right up there with the Thomas at LACC out in California and the Crump at Pine Valley. I mean, these are the elite amateurs, senior amateurs in the country. They all get together. Um, I'm guessing that hang has got to be pretty cool. Um, 
the people that you're into year after year, the stories that are shared. If um, I hate to have you single one or two guys out, but if you see a couple guys at a table having a beer and talking, who are some of those guys that, man, I got to swing by and see what the hell they're talking about because there's got to well, be a good I story mean, somewhere. When you're, when you're in the room, you know, it's like, uh, you know, one year I won and they ask you to get up and say a few words. And of course, I, I, I've not even thought about it. You know, I'm just kind of sitting there. But then I, on the way up to the podium, I thought, you know, I think the, the most appropriate thing to say is just, you know, how glad I am to be in the room right. with the people that are in the room, you know. And so, look, I told my wife a story this morning. Uh, the year, I think, this was a couple of years ago, I think I, I'd won the senior. Uh, uh, Gene and I had a, had a battle there the last day, and, and we had a rain delay. And so we finished the second round on Saturday morning, and we had a little break. And so, so I, just getting ready to go to the tee, I was in the last group. So I went in the locker room, and I'm, I'm – I'm going to the bathroom and I'm the only one in the, in the bathroom standing at the urinal. Well, some guy comes in and he's standing right next to me. Well, I'm just looking straight ahead. Sure. Thinking, thinking about the first tee shot. And I kind of glance, I, you know, feel somebody's looking at you and I look over and there's George Bush, you know, <laughs> he's standing right there beside me, got that grin on his face. He said, Hey, howdy partner. How you doing? I said, Hey man, pretty good. How about yourself? And, and and just washed my hands and just out the door, went to the tea and off we go. I'd, <laughs> so you were subject to see anybody, yeah. you know, there, you know, that'll, so it was, that'll, it put, was things kinda, in, that'll kinda, put things in perspective. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was kind of funny really when you think about it, when you think back on it. I love that story. Um, you and I talked about something before we started this episode about the different levels of, of golfer, whether it's the right. scratch guy or, the, the guy that wins at the state, but not at the national level. Well, well I, I'm sure at around 2009, 2010, you're getting some interesting questions because you become eligible for the U.S. Senior Open and your first run in 2009, you, you hold the lead after 36 holes. You've, you've been the low amateur more than anyone at the U.S. Senior Open. And I'm guessing at that point, you're getting some people – tapping on the shoulder saying, Hey, you know, they got this champions tour thing you could possibly do. Um, <laughs> yeah. What is something that maybe you learned at the U S senior open about the level, the difference in levels between a really good senior amateur and a senior professional that whether or not you yeah. were thinking about turning pro well, or not. The, the third, the first lesson that I learned is that age has a way of leveling the field, the playing fields out. Okay. So, here I am, a, 50, a young 50-year-old. That's what I would describe myself as at sure. the time. Even even in golf years, you know, a young 50-year-old. And I and I had I had prepared all year for the, the qualifier. I prepared my schedule. I, was gonna, I went to play the Porter in the Northeast. I played against the very best competition I could play just to prepare me. And when I got there, I played practice round with, with uh, Kite and – uh, uh, Langer and you know I mean all the guys at you know top of the top of the peep and I'm like Dang, they really don't play much different than I play uh -huh. you know uh -huh. they hit the ball we hit the ball the same distance I may be a little longer uh, you know now you know they they may hit one more fairway sure. than I do they may hit one more green you know but but just you know the eye test you know I can I can compete. And uh, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I had my 14 year old son caddying for me. It was just a, it was, it was magic. It was magic, really. And the people there at Crooked, they had huge crowds, and the, and everybody there was pulling for me. It was, I'm telling you, it was, it was crazy. <laughs> uh, I mean, you no, know, I was the only guy that had a, that had a bag stand, you know. Right. So my right. son, my son's carrying my Titleist bag, you know, with the bag stand and. And give a shout out to Titleist there, but sure. um, we can do we do and, that uh, from time to time. Yeah. That's cool. Uh huh. But anyway, that 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 first day, you know, we played in the afternoon, played late. It was you know played really well, and we really didn't have much time to sleep on it. You know, kind of go to dinner, hit the bed up early the next morning, and shoot back up, shoot sixty six. You know, right behind that. Yeah. And uh, so I look back on it now. You know, having him on the bag and experience that, 
you know, he had never, you know, he just heard some of the stories about the masters. He'd never, you know, he, he obviously was there when he was, you know, nine years old, but right. to be able to be, you know, there in the mix and, you know, reading the putts and, you know, helping with the clubs. And, you know, I could just, I mean, it, it's really, I can remember 11, that's 11 years ago. I mean, I can remember on the 18th hole, the, that second day I hit a tee shot just in the first cut and the pin was in the back and, but there was no way I could land it on the green. So I had to bounce it between that water on the right and that front left bunker. It's like a 170 shot. He said, well, that's a perfect seven iron. I said, no, actually, it's an eight iron. He said, Dad, you can't hit it. I said, this ball's going to jump, yep. and I'm going to try to land it just in, just on the front of the green, and I'll be dead gun if it comes off perfect. And he, he looks at me and he said, you smart ass. <laughs> 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 And I said, well, you know, sometimes it comes, it comes off Austin. Other, sometimes it doesn't, you know, sometimes it'll squirt a little right and we're up there dropping, you know, hitting our fourth, you know, so, sure. um, but anyway, yeah, it was quickly stick was a wonderful experience, you know, just not only from a competitive standpoint, you know, cause it did answer it, it, it affirmed. And I think that's why I played well into on into my mid fifties. You know, I won like my fifth state amateur when I was 53. And then I won again my sixth time when I was 55. And that one was special. That was special for me because it was the oldest person that's ever won in the state of Tennessee. And so I, you know, that, that was, um, and I, and I, and I think it's all because of the week I had at Crooked Stick. It gave me the confidence that, you know, I can, you know, if I play anywhere up near my game, I'm, I'm going to be there in the end, going to be close anyway. Yeah. So, um, that, but that, uh, that's great wow you just imagine just knocking that uh pulling that shot off in front of, uh with, with your son on the bag and just uh like yeah i know what i'm doing kid i mean i uh it's kind of a little cuppy bird but kind of bird nest kind of a lie sure. you know and, and uh i'm looking at it he said oh man he said that that's a perfect seven iron for you i said i said that's too much club yeah. and he you know so we had a little back and forth i said all right let me let me go here let me let's let's give it a, <laughs> he yeah. he really he, i don't know i don't know your son at all but it really sounds like he came into his own that week didn't he oh he hey it was great it was yeah. hey and there's a there's another story going into the third going into the third round yeah uh so we're the last group and uh so we're walking through this i mean i mean mass of people going to the first tee and just as we're getting to the back of to the tee box, this this arm comes sticking out of the crowd with a piece of paper, and so Austin just reaches up and grabs it. Uh-huh. And of course, I don't know what it is until we get finished. But long story short, there's a little girl that's kind of you know, kind of wants to get to know him and meet him, and she slips him a piece of paper with her name and phone number. Perfect. So when round, yeah, when the round's over. And I'm coming out trying to find him. I can't find him anywhere. There he was, way over by the flagpole, sitting there with her. You know, they're talking. So I mean, yeah, yeah, his work's done, <laughs> Dad. I mean, he's. I mean, he got you around the course. Now he's he's got other things to tend to. I mean, you're kind of cramping yeah. his space, don't you think? Well, we and what was what was kind of neat about it. Um, we actually got we played and we played late the next day and. Uh, so I couldn't get the flight, so we had to spend an extra night. So we went to dinner no. on Sunday night with with her and her family. You're her kidding. dad, her <laughs> dad and I, we did exactly. We had the same careers. It was it was scary almost. Really? We were C, both CPAs. He was a Notre Dame grad. We were both CPAs, and we both we both were doing deals. And I we, I did a lot of real estate, sure. you know, type deals and development. And he was doing the same type stuff. So we, he and I just sat down. It was just a great, you know, brainstorming. And his daughter was beautiful. I mean, she was, a, you know, a great little soccer player. And so we worked it all out where they were going to come down. We were, we were Ole Miss season ticket holders, you know, in SEC football. Sure. And so they were going to come down to a LSU uh, Ole Miss game, and then we were going up for the Michigan uh, Notre Dame game. You know, kind of, yeah, and a little, so a little home and home thing. Yeah, and so Austin messed that up. He he made the he made the high school golf team his freshman year and had his first tournament it was a conflict with 
oh, going up there. And of course, we call the whole the whole thing unraveled. So oh. we, we didn't get to we didn't get to do that. So um, I said, man, you're going to have a lot of golf tournaments. But how many times are you going to get to go see Michigan and Notre Dame play? I, so, I mean. I... I don't even know what to say about that. I mean, I think uh, thanks. Uh, I was getting along with your son so well, and then it just I know. he but let I, me down. Man. But I, but I do like the fact that he's pulling numbers when he's catting for you at the U.S. Senior Open. I mean, that's oh, that's a I, pretty yeah. that's an all time story I, right there. He is phenomenal. I tell you, he <laughs> he really is. He is the wisest. He's twenty five years old. He just got married a couple weeks ago, and he is the wisest, sharpest twenty five year old I've ever been around. He is way older than his years i mean he's just mature he loves you know he can sit and talk to you to me and he just you know it's just like he's one of us wow. you, know, you don't even realize he's 25 that's incredible so i kind of rambled on too much about that no that no was- no that's perfect that's perfect um well, gosh, this this was you know I, I alluded to this question early in the episode where I wasn't going to let let you off the hook about uh, Danny Green. You know, I spoke with yeah, a former love to talk love to talk about that. Well, see, I spoke with a former Tennessee Golf Association administrator a long while back, and they said, "Well, Tim Jackson is the goat. He's the greatest of all time. You got to have him on your podcast." But Danny Green's the goat of storytelling, and you've been just providing some killer stories in this episode so i but i guess you know i gotta let you tell a danny green story and i don't want to hear the i don't want to hear any buddy ryan story about about about, i don't want to hear that one i already know that one so so and and we have full editing capability here so we'll 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 treat him well but give me a danny green story i mean this is this is another tennessee golf legend i mean uh, numerous amateur titles and you guys won state team together with brand snedeker yeah, um, yeah. I mean, he's he's I think ten time Tennessee Player of the Year. He's right up there with you. So go well, ahead. We, yeah, we go all the way back to the late seventies playing what we used to call the the fried chicken circuit. So there's a uh, there's a bunch of small towns in West Tennessee, and just about every one of them had a either a, a nine hole golf course with two sets of tees, or they had an eighteen hole course that you know wasn't really much to it. And that's where we that's where we cut our teeth. That's where we both started. And, uh, and so we, that's where I met Danny and Danny's a couple years older than I am. And so in the early years, he was, he was the better player. No question about it. And I'll say this about his game. He's, he's, the, he's the greatest putter that I've ever, you know, I've, and I've played with a lot of good putters, but the thing about Danny is I played a lot of golf with Danny over a 35 year period. And he's always good. Okay, there's wow. never, there's never really a bad day. And and so, competitively, he and I played in the finals of the Terracotta one year. I think oh. it was 2000 or 99. We played in the, in the we we played in the. There's an interesting format where they had 16 players, and then you would the mo four would then go to match play and you play for the championship. So we we made it to the finals, and and Danny beat me one up. And he had 23 putts. Holy shit. <laughs> yes. The day, and I, and I got to going back over that in my head on the flight home. And I couldn't believe, like he gets up on one. It's a little short dog leg left hose, like a three wood or a four wood off the tee and then a wedge. And he gets up and pull hooks it into the scrub, chips it out sideways, knocks it on the green 20 feet, bingo. And then we're off. That, that's we're off to the races. Yeah. That's kind of what it looked like. All what it looked like the whole match. And of course, you know, I, you know, and there I am with opportunities, and I'm not able to close the, those opportunities out. And he's just hanging in there, hanging here, making these par saves. And it's just, it's just, it was a thing to watch. I mean, it was unbelievable. Wow. But he, in in my opinion, he's the best putter that I've ever seen on a consistent basis. And I had the utmost respect for Danny and his competitive nature. He's not afraid of anything. You know, he's, uh, he's just, he's old school, man. He's just, you know, he's not afraid and he's unorthodox and he loves to be the underdog. And, um, Danny, Danny, what another good thing about Danny is his straightforwardness and his honesty, you know? So he, he meet these kids around Tennessee and, you know, these kids that play college golf and they have, you know, so-so college golf careers and they say, well, what, what are you about to do? You just getting out of school. What, what are you going to do next? And the kid will say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to try to 
play professional golf. Mm -hmm. And he said, boy, what are you talking about? He said, you need to get your head screwed on straight. You can't even beat me. And for you to be thinking about going out there and playing with those guys, you need to be giving me shots, but you can't even beat me right now. And, I, and we so the year we won the state team, we had Snedeker on the team. Yeah, We were up in Boston. And uh, so we're playing for a couple of practice rounds, and Brant's kind of skinking it around. And neither one of us had played that much for Brant. We're from West Tennessee, and Brant's from Nashville. And uh, Danny said, I don't know what this boy's going to do. He's, you know, he's won the – public links this year and he's going to be playing in Augusta and the way he's playing he, he he needs to be thinking about you know getting a job you know working for a living uh-huh. I said well Danny all I know is that I've I've only played with him three or four times I said but I've seen some of the scores that he's shot some of these tournaments and he he probably has more upside than me and you have you know and <laughs> yeah. that was kind of the end of it and of course then Brant Brant goes on having a nice professional career and you know uh but the, the, the Danny is, you, if you want a, if you want his opinion, you want an answer to a question, you, you just ask him. You're gonna get it, whether you like it or not. It's going it's not gonna be filtered. It's not gonna be politically correct. It's gonna be honest, straight from the heart. And uh, I think he's a blast. He's just you know he's a blast to be around. Yeah. You're playing, and you may have to edit this, but, but yeah, let's see where it goes. Let's see where it goes. But so we're playing way back in the day. We're playing in a partner deal. I want to. I want to say it was a scramble. I, I can't remember, but you know, in a scramble format, you you really it's a, against good players. It's almost impossible to make up shots. You know, when you think about it. Yeah. So we were like two shots behind going the last day. So we're playing these guys, and they hit it into this hole about four feet, and we're about fifteen feet. Danny's putting second. And I missed it. And Danny gets up there and he he drains the fifteen footer. Well, they missed the four footer. Now we're now we're like, you know, one behind. We're walking off the green, and he says it loud enough. He says this quote unquote, "Boys, when that ball of mine went in the hole, you could hear two sets of nuts hit the ground, and it was it was game it was game on for right then. And we went right we went right in and <laughs> and uh." But that's that's him. He's a he's a he's a competitor, and uh, you know, and he loved and he he loved it. He loved to compete, and uh, but he, he there wasn't anybody that played more golf than Danny. I mean, he he played started in April and went all the way through October. He was somewhere every week. Uh, I'm I'm starting to think that that maybe I might be able to get some, him to tell me some stories if I can corral him for uh, for for an episode here at the back of the range. Oh my god! You got to you, you get him. Hey, there are a lot of stories. Yeah, I will tell you that. And uh, yeah, the buddy Ryan was was uh, I couldn't wait to tell him that. You know, cause, oh, I bet that was because Danny was always you know like we all are. You know, we're all self conscious about what we're doing and how we look doing it. Sure. You know, and Danny knew he was unorthodox and that he, you know, he kind of, he kind of squatted down a little bit, kind of a lot of bend in his knees and he reached for the ball and he said, I know I look goofy standing over it and this and that. I said, well, I've looked at it so long. It doesn't, it looks, it looks natural to me. It doesn't, you know, I mean, it doesn't, um, but, but, uh, but I knew when he come walking up that hill and that guy said, look at this guy. Coming up through here, I look just like Buddy Ryan. What's he doing out here? Oh, that just couldn't wait to tell him that. You know, he said, "What's that son of a bitch? What, what's he doing?" You know. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, I'll have to I'll have to try and get in touch with the, with Danny because that sounds like it sounds like a blast. Um, well, there's one last one I wanted to have you. I wanted to see if I can get get an answer from you. This one last one, then I'll let you go. But. Um, is there one match? Well, let's see if we could do this. We I was going to ask you if there was one match you'd like to have back or play again or maybe rekindle a rivalry. Oh, uh, you know, you, what, you you already know the answers to all these questions. You're well, asking. actually, well, actually, this one I may not know. The one I was yeah. thinking of is: Would you, uh, you know, would you like to have another sh- crack at Tiger? And and you well, know, and I don't know if that's one that well, Tiger like, Tiger gave me. A, and and I don't know where this came from, but he he was very very nice about my game and respectful, and he made some comment on somebody I'd never read it, but I was told that in his first book that he had 
he had mentioned me and Hank Keeney as being two people in match play that he would consider would be, you know, tough, tough outs. And so I, you know, that that's, I appreciate that. That's uh, that's nice to hear, but actually, no, the one that I want back is the one in 95 in the quarterfinals at, um, Marion up in Rhode Island, uh, oh, Rhode Newport, Island, Newport, Newport, Newport at Newport. So that particular summer, uh, I'd already been named to the Walker cup team and I'd been, and I was having a great summer. I had top fives and just about all the big events and, uh, and, you know, been real consistent playing really well. And, uh, so I beat Darren styles, yeah. Chris, Christian, uh, Oh, it wasn't, it wasn't Christian Rainer. It was another college All-American. His name was Christian something. And Charles Howe. I beat those three guys first three matches at uh, Newport. And uh, so I got Marucci in the quarters. Oh, okay. And then and I'm looking at the draw. And I'm, and, and I'm number, and, you know, back then you had the Titleist rankings. And Tiger was number one and I was number two. And we're in opposite sides. We're going to play each other in the finals. And I'm looking at this. And I got Marucci in the quarters. That's the one match that I wore over, and you know between you and me, and you can, you can, you can let this stand, or you can edit it out however you want to do it. But that's that's the one match that I actually went inside the locker room, went in the went in the stall, and I shed a couple of tears over that one because wow. I should not have lost that match. Wow, and um, it was just a, a series of events there. I mean, it was. You know, to Buddy's credit, Buddy's a scrapper, and he's scrapping around, and he's hanging in there making pars. But he, he, he got up and down on a hole uh, that he wouldn't, he shouldn't have been able to finish. I think it was the, might have been the seventeenth hole, or the sixteenth. It was late, and I, and I, and I'm one down, I think, at the time. And he hits it in the high stuff, and he hits it out, and he's still the high stuff, and he's short right of the green and the pins toward the front and i'm and i'm up there on the green i'm like eight feet from the hole for with for a birdie and he hits the ball and it comes out of this high grass and it's dead off to the side this is back when i had pretty good eyesight and this ball is turning over like an overhead tennis ball right over with overspin on it yeah and it lands on the green takes one hop and hits a flag stick dead center and drops three feet and he makes the putt. I missed the putt. And he goes on to beat me in extra holes um, on the 19th hole, I think it was. And I was st- – I tell you, I was never – it just goes to show you that you, you can't – and I learned – what I learned from that match is you don't, you don't take anything for granted in match play. Everybody's capable of beating you on any day. But that was one right there that – should have went my way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still convinced. That's the one I want back. That oh, one. Okay. And I'm friends with Buddy. I, you know, but, oh, but I yeah. think Buddy. I think Buddy would tell you the same thing that he, he Buddy shouldn't have won that match. You know. Well, next time uh, I talk to Buddy Marucci, I'm going to definitely ask him about that match. Yeah, and he'll probably tell you about that up and down he <laughs> made over there. Wow. Well, Tim, I got to tell you, man, you are as advertised. I, I knew this was going to be a great one. Uh, we didn't even, I mean, there's so much stuff we left on the table. We may need to do this again sometime, but uh, I really do appreciate you taking the time. I hope everything with uh, Tennessee golf uh, goes off without a hitch this summer. I hope you get to get out and play this summer. And, uh, yeah, let's let's try to do this again. I'm glad you stopped by the back of the range. Well, Ben, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, there's nothing more I like talking about, you know, golf and particularly um, – uh, re- being able to relive some some really sweet memories, you know, it's just it's just really it's really a good time, and I enjoy being with you. And uh, yeah, I'd love to do it again. We'll look forward to that. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tim. Take take care. And there you have it. Told you that episode was going to be amazing. Special thanks to Tim Jackson for joining me this week here at the back of the range. I will get him back on again very soon. And yes, I will chase down Danny Green also. Don't forget, follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and even Instagram. And every episode is available at thebackoftherange.com. We'll see you next time for another episode here at the Back of the Range.